Hi, this is Al. We are at the Kelly Writers House in Philadelphia, USA. It's 10 a.m. here. It's uh, disparate times where you are. We're so happy that you've joined us for our first ModPo live webcast. And we've got a cast of characters here, and we need to introduce people, particularly those that you're not familiar with through the videos. For instance, Zach Cardiner, who is our frontline guru, tech guru for, for ModPo. Can they... <laughs> Wait, wait, come on, you got to get into the camera. Come on, Zach. That's Zach. Uh, we wanted to, okay, so Zach's great, and there's Zach. Thank you, Zach. And Chris Martin, who's the brains behind the operation, he's in the back, and he's going to get a close up, I think. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Hello, Chris. Thank you again for everything you do for ModPo. You're the best. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you. And Lily Applebaum, who ModPo Plusers get to see in the videos, but. Uh, uh, you know, otherwise you're seeing her in the webcast, and she's amazing. She's great. She's Lily, and Lily has in front of her a phone. If you tip down the camera, you'll see the phone, and the phone. There's the f pick up the phone. There it is. That's the phone. Thank you, Zach. Yes. So that phone is. This is what we used to call POTS, a POTS line, plain old telephone service, POTS. So here we are doing a MOOC. It's sophisticated. It's cool. It's on a platform that it can accommodate tens of thousands of people. But we're using a plain old telephone line, which means if you call the following number sometime between now and an hour and 15 minutes from now, you are going to reach Lily, who will talk quietly to you. And then through the magic of whatever Zach and Chris can do, we're going to bring the, the sound, the audio, up into the room. And that will mean that we'll get to talk to you directly. And the number is 215-573-9752. That's 215-573-9752. Before I complete my introductions, I'll also remind you of something you know from the announcements. You can comment or send a question by writing in the webcast, the live webcast, the 9, this is 910, right? 91014 webcast forum in our discussion forums. And Julia Block, who's sitting to my left and your right. Hello, Julia. Good morning. Morning, Al. Julia will be looking on her little cool little laptop here, not just at the discussion forums, and she'll be responding to you, but also maybe having a chance to grab the mic and um, pose a question or comment for you. She's also going to be looking at our Twitter feed. We are t Twitterific people, aren't we? We yes. like, you and I like Twitter. Um, and so Julia will be looking at the Twitter feed. And really all you have to do is use a hashtag. And the hashtag is ModPoLive or ModOlive. Yeah. <laughs> ModPoLive. Mod hashtag ModPoLive. You can also put an at ModPoPen, P-E-N-N, -E -N, if you want to grab our attention. So that's another way of reaching us. And also by the phone, 215-573-9752. Now let's um, make... <coughs> Jason, who's also not in the videos, who is a pal of ModPo. Can we turn around on Jason? Zach? There's Jason. Good morning, Jason. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going for a ride here. There's Jason. Good morning, Hi. Jason. Good Beloved morning, ModPo TA. How are you? I'm quite well. He has a dual function. One is to be Jason, Jason Brilliant, which, sorry to put the pressure on you, but he has this way of just summing things up. But also, he's holding the portable mic, which means that some people in the room whom I will introduce also uh, will uh, get a chance to speak. And they probably didn't know that when they showed up. Linda's thinking, I'm never coming again because he's <laughs> going to make me speak. And someone just joined us. What's your name, sir? Uh, my name's Tim Fanning. Tim, how are you? Welcome to ModPo. So we do have some people in the room here. We also have some TAs who are far flung. And let's see. Let's sell, say hello to them in turn. Anna Strong in Boston. Good morning, Anna. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. That's great. Emily Harnett in New Haven. How are Hi. you? I'm good. How are you? Great to see you. I like the way you put your little bulletin board behind you so we can look at all your little notes. <laughs> this is all for you, Bill. <laughs> Erica Kaufman is at Bard College. I think you're up at Bard this morning, are you? Yep. Good morning. Good I'm morning. Here. This is Erica, who, with Julia Block, has co -cur created and co-curated our teacher resource section. I'm so pleased to have you here. Molly O'Neill in Los Angeles at five minutes after 7 a.m. Good morning, Molly. Good morning. <laughs> how, how is L.A.? We miss it's, you. It's wonderful. <laughs> 
That's great. Good morning. And we have here, all the way from Chicago, to my far right, but not your far right, not anybody's far right, Max <laughs> McKenna himself. Good morning, Max. Good morning, Al. How are you? It's great to I'm see you. I'm good. I didn't come all the way from Chicago today, uh, only from New Jersey. And I had the pleasure of crossing the Walt Whitman Bridge, which was very appropriate. Ah, so you, you left the state of William Carlos Williams and you crossed the state of Ezra Pound. State of mind. <laughs> you crossed the state of mind of Walt Whitman. And here you are hanging around with Mud Poe. And Dave Poplar. Morning. Morning, Dave. How are you? Good Fine. Good to see you. Looking good. You seem to be getting the gray out of your beard. I guess all the gray you're getting out is coming into mine or something like that. And sitting to my right, who is normally in the Boston area but is joining us in Philly today, is Amaris Kachansky. Good morning, Amaris. Morning, Al. So we're going to get started right away, and I've already said hello to Julia. Good morning. Morning. So this is an open forum. Lily will answer the phone. We'll talk about stuff. The PAs and the people in the room will help us talk about stuff, and it's just going to happen organically as it always does. And so while we wait for the first call, uh, what do we have in the Twitter feed? Anything interesting? So Stacy Craig um, just asked, why do we have so many conversations about Emily versus Walt? Why can't they peacefully coexist? <laughs> All right. Such a good this has actually been talked about in a couple of the threads, but it's worth getting back to. Max, what would you say first of all? And then I'm going to turn to Emily Harnett. Max, why, what's the purpose of making a false distinction? Clearly, we have both poets, and we don't need to argue it. Is there a pedagogical value, maybe? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Setting up the opposition or, or the kind of controversy or something is a way of thinking of two trends that we'll be tracing, as I would say, you know, reductively a maximalist versus a minimalist trend, for instance. Maximalist versus minimalist, extensive versus intensive, long lines versus short yep. lines, a belief on Whitman's part that everything could be brought into the poem and therefore a democratic impulse to lists and catalogs, Emily feeling rather that if we pick just the right one thing, we'll be able to know the whole world from that one thing. So one in many versus many in one, they're very different in a lot of ways. But they're the same, Emily Harnett, how are they the same? I mean, because Stacy has a point. They're both radically different, but they're the same. They're differently radical. Go ahead, Emily. Um, well, if they're differently radical, they're still ultimately radical, right? And both of these poets are experimenting with different styles, different arguments than what we were familiar with in their time frame. So in that sense, opposing them uh, makes a false distinction between one is radical and maybe one is more traditional, and that's certainly not what we're trying to say. Beautiful. Thank you for the question, Stacy. So here comes our first call. Meantime, uh, Julia, what do we have? Sorry, I, I got lost to the discussion. A lot of people are posting, and I want to give a shout How out How many people to, are posting in this new forum just for the webcasts? Um, I'm seeing like at least a dozen names, Great. I think. Great. Um, and Philip Drexler points out, today is Philip H Drexler. Hello, Philip. I believe Philip is in Texas. Is that right? I think so. Anybody know? So. Yeah. Um, Philip, Philip points out that today is HD's birthday. We're not going to get to HD for another <laughs> week, at least. But We're getting to HD two weeks from now, week three, the rise of imagism. But I... HD is a Philadelphian. I mean, she was. I went to went to school at Bryn Mawr, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Eric, give Eric the mic. What do you want to say briefly uh, about HD's? Oh. Yes, yeah. yeah, she she um did not attend Penn, but she hung around with Pound and Williams okay, in the quad in Williams quad room. Quite quite a little quad gathering. Qu our quadrangle gathering. Anyway. Uh, thank you, Philip. We're going to have to sing happy birthday to HD uh, a little later. Uh, Lily, we have somebody on the phone. Um, this is Joanne from Atlanta, and she has a question about what a conceit is. Okay. Bring her up. Whoa. Good morning, Joanne. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. I'm listening to is this Al. Yes, it is. Hi. You can. Are you watching us video or audio only? I'm um, watching the video, which is like you're saying different things from what I'm talking to you about. Yes. So anyway. we recommend Joanne that you turn down the audio while you're talking on the phone because there's a delay and it's very confusing. Yeah, yeah. I and we can actually hear the delay. Okay. Turn the audio down, and I'm going I to have. Erica, yes. Co Erica Kaufman, if she wants to, can answer this question about conceit. Go ahead, Joanne. Pose your question, please. Okay. My question is, um, 
I don't know very much about poetry. Somehow I avoided it in all of my education because I didn't understand it, so that's why I'm taking the course. What is a conceit? That's my question. I was watching the first um, the first class, and they talk, and your your assistants, and you talked about conceits in poetry. Yes. So uh, I'm going to let Erica start us off in saying what a conceit is. But um, may I ask, and don't take this the wrong way, but have you been at all into the discussion forums at MOTPO? No, I missed the first class be honest, okay. and I'm just trying to catch up. Oh, I'm week. so glad that you're doing that, and you're in the situation with thousands of people. Um, so we, we're happy to answer the question. What I recommend you do is to click on discussion forums on the left side of any Modpo page, and then right. when you get to that, you're going to see a search box, and if you type the word conceit into the search box, you're going to find um, probably dozens of really interesting conversations about what a conceit is. Oh, okay, I great. love the idea that the webcast is useful for answering questions, but we're all about, um, at the same time, we're all about our discussion forums because people kind of crowdsource answers. So it's cool. Um, anyway, so Erica Kaufman at Bard, would you like to take a crack at this question from Joanne in Atlanta? Sure. Um, Hi. I'm... Hi. Hi, Joanne. How are you? I'm good. How are things? Uh, New York State. Great. Um, so when I when I think about what a conceit is in poetry, I think of it as kind of um, a poet's use of almost like an extended metaphor in order to do something with the way that the poet the poem is functioning or what what the poem is saying to the reader. Uh huh. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. That's sort of what I gathered it was. Joanne, um, in, Joanne in, in the Dickinson poems, can you just pick out a conceit and we can talk about it for a minute? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've only like looked at two of them. The first... Um, I dwell in possibility. Okay, yeah, the one about the house. Okay, so um, what's the conceit there, do you think? Well, the whole structure of the house. Yeah. The house and the she's, windows and the and the roof and the door and that sort of there's thing. There's your extended conceit. She's elaborating the idea that the poem, it turns out, is like a house or something is like a house. It's, right. You know, Emily Dickinson is not ultimately really that interested, probably, in the building of a house or the construction of the house. So we already right. know we've got a kind of parallel thing being set up between mm -hmm. between X and the house. And as mm -hmm. X gets elaborated, you realize that it's this, which is the occupation of doing what she does. Right. So you've got windows and doors, and each of them is potentially metaphorical, and that's the extended conceit. But I'm going to turn to Amaris to mm -hmm. tell us a little bit, Joanne, about what, and, and she can pass this on to Dave if she wants, but what's so unusual about the way Emily Dickinson handles conceit in any given poem? What's okay. experimental about that, Amaris? Cool. Um, hmm, in general? <laughs> yeah, what, why? Sh she doesn't use conceits in a conventional way. Can you think of, and maybe Dave can help, you can think of ways in which she varies the usual way a conceit works? Um, I guess usually conceits have a very literal sense, um, whereas here she's metaphorizing in a meta-poetic sense to refer to her writing practice. Okay, so she's um, meta-poetic, that's one thing. Dave Poplar? She also pushes them far and wanders <clears throat> wanders from them to, to the point where they're, they're almost unrecognizable. She digresses. So the conceits right. fall apart. In um, I Dwell in Possibility, she keeps the conceit pretty well, but in the brain within its groove, what happens? Well, uh, that may be a poem you haven't gotten to, but uh, anybody else in the room. Um, what happens when she starts the conceit in the brain within its groove? Max, what happens? Well, she, she swerves, uh, as she says in the poem, about halfway through. Uh, so she doesn't just introduce a swerve in the content or plot or no. story of the poem. She does what? She introduces a sort of metaphorical swerve from one register to another. So, Anna in Boston, hi. Hey, Anna. Are you there? I don't know if we can... I unmuted it. I'm good. There you are. Tell us a little more about the brain within its groove. What is so effing amazing 
about the brain within its groove in the way it deals with extended conceits. What is? Um, why do we get so excited about this swerving? Well, because the the words are not only swerving. You're just not only just using the word swerve, but right at that moment, the form has a a shift. Um, so the the form of the poem kind of enacts that swerving motion where she says, um, "I'm just pulling up my PDF here." She says, "But let to, let us splinter swerve." were easier for you to put a current back when floods have slipped the hills. You know, kind of, it, it, it enacts that um, kind of radical shift that she's making, which changes not only um, the first extended metaphor that she's, she's used, which is this groove, um, to all of a sudden talking about floods and currents and turnpikes. So groove at the beginning, thank you, Anna, groove at the beginning could be related to a flood, but it's not clear yet, right? So right. you've got a brain like a groove running evenly like some kind of wheel. Then you have a flood, and then the flood in the story of the poem takes over and knocks everything out of its way, including the mill, which has been set up by the river in order to do its power making, and you realize that the brain is more powerful. So, Joanne, we have there we have a, a conceit run amok. We have a conceit that winds up running over everything in the in its way. Does that make sense yeah. to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this brings up a related question. One reason that I've never been able to really appreciate poetry is that I feel like it's inaccessible. It's so far from what I'm learning from the course is that poems are a little bit like, well, Emily Dickinson's poems at least, are a little bit like puzzles. And mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out what, they mean, mm -hmm. and you need to know all the references. Um, I have a friend who writes poetry, and I find her poems the same way, versus the poems that Garrison right. Keillor reads often right. um, at 11 o'clock in the morning, here in Atlanta at least, mm -hmm. are much more accessible, and you've right. used the term elitist to describe Emily Dickinson, and I wonder if that has to do with um, having to figure out what all these references are, and if you aren't well educated and thoughtful, it's very right. hard to figure out what they are. Thank you, Joanne. Sense? I am going to ask you to hang up and then turn your audio back up. That will allow us to, to respond, a bunch of people in this room, to respond to this fundamental question that you've raised, not just about Dickinson, but about all of Modpo and about modern and contemporary experimental poetry. So if you hang up, turn the audio up, Oh, by the way, what was your major in college? You said that you didn't do a lot of poetry. Well, I I was a history psychology major, and I have a PhD in psychology, oh, and I'm extremely well read. So I'm well read in everything except poetry. So you I'm have, but course. you but you have, and you speak the language very well and articulately, not just as a PhD, as a human being from Atlanta calling us this morning. And so I would suggest that you don't need any knowledge of special references in order to understand what we're talking about. And that's sort of what we're going to say in a minute after we hang up. So thank you for calling, Joanne, okay. and we'll see you in the discussion forums. Thank you okay. so much. And now the All phone... Right. Thank you, Joanne. And now the phone is available for 215-573-9752. I, I want very brief responses. I'm going to go around. I'm going to ask for very brief responses. What Joanne has done is she said, do I have to have special knowledge? What do I do with the fact that the poems seem inaccessible? Do I have to know all the references? What's going on? So I'm going to ask uh, Julia to take a shot at that, then Jason very briefly, and then I'm going to go to Molly on that one. So, Julia, how do you respond to Joanne's concern? Um, I'm going to go out on a limb to Joanne and others who feel this way and say, you already know the references. You already know, you already have a relationship to this language. You don't have to have specialized knowledge. Um, if you want to do research, that's great. I always encourage people to do that. But you can experience the poem as you experience it. You can read it, and you can talk about it with others, and you, you already bring a tremendous amount of knowledge to your reading. And close reading enables that, too. And so does crowdsourced reading, meaning the, the readings that are given by hundreds and thousands of people. Basically, if you don't know what the mid-19th century uh, connotation of the word checks is, Right for the poem called what's the poem called? I never saw, I never saw more, which is in Mod Pub Plus. 
someone will come up with it. Mm -hmm. um, Jason, would you bring the f the microphone to uh, Michael or Meredith because Dan has something he wants to say. So here's Michael speaking for Dan. Dan just spelled, my experience is that if the puzzles are broken into small pieces, the education arrives, and the forums break the puzzles up. Oh, that was really oh, beautiful. One of the many things that Dan said in that incredible, pithy Dickinsonian comment <laughs> is that we, if, if, Joanne and everyone else, if we break things down into small pieces, then they become more accessible, and then we put it back together again. Jason, briefly on this question of inaccessibility and difficulty and... Um, I had to look up the word gambrels um, because I couldn't handle not being certain if I remembered the definition correctly. And that sent me off into uh, an investigation of, of gambrels and opened up ideas about the poem. But I also didn't need to look up the word, and I would have had a different experience. So... It's a, not a puzzle, but more like having, thinking about a dream that you had, and there's no necessarily correct singular interpretation. You're just looking for all of the intersection of different words and, and feelings that they elicit in you. And so to trust, trust yourself more than you are allowed to do in other educational situations like trust your your own kind of constellation of associations and in the poem like the brain within its groove that serves you well because the if the poem is not going to sit still it's going to run over you and you have to allow that to happen Molly O'Neill early morning in Los Angeles if have you had your coffee yet uh, yeah I'm working on it <laughs> what do you uh, think about this question Joanne raises a fundamental question about Mod Po Sure. I mean, for me, it's it's a very instinctive process when you look at a poem to just kind of allow certain words to jump out at you. Um, and that gives you kind of a starting place. And from there, you can look at the context, look at the words before and after, the lines around that, and then you start to kind of thread these connections together. And that's really helpful for providing a little bit more of a, an understanding Thank you so much, all of you. And I'll just finally say for Joanne that we're going to talk a lot about this over the weeks in ModPo. The whole point of, of studying so-called difficult poems as opposed to so-called easy poems is because it's worth doing the thinking, the work, the collaborative effort. It's worth the effort. Julia, you look like you have something to add to that. Mm, I have another question. Are we ready to... Yeah, we question? have somebody in the phone, but let's go to a question from the forums okay, first. Okay, it might be a quick one. Ha ha. It's about truth. Um, <laughs> so Charles, both Charles Doherty on uh, the discussion forum and uh, someone on Twitter. Um, I can't find it. Oh, no, Harley on Twitter. Both have a question about the word truth. Um, for Harley, it's a question about truth in Dickinson and Whitman. And for Charles, it's specifically about that word or that phrase and true in the brain within its groove. Um, Charles says, the groove is not always bad. How can the constantly splintered mind be strong enough, wise enough to join those who dwell in possibility? There can't simply be destruction and renewal. So nice. if I understand his question correctly, it's um, what, is, what does that word true mean there? Yeah. All right. So let's just focus on that for a second. Uh, so, Dave, the brain within its groove runs evenly and true, but, and then she goes on to talk about what for her is a more exciting and destructive and crazy situation. I just, I have a, right? I just, so what does true mean there? It's, what does it mean? I just want to start with a, a, a general observation. We were talking initially about the differences between uh, Dickinson and Whitman, and I think truth hits it right on the head about something that ties them both together, because in a sense, if you look at it, they both do believe in some type of absolute truth. They just have different ways of going about finding it. Thank you. She uses the word true there, but, but what? Emily, the brain within its groove runs evenly and true, but let a splinter swerve, and now the poem is going to do something fun and positive and exciting. So that means that true isn't all that it's cracked up to be. 
Emily, what are we going to do with the word true, which is sort of left behind by the exciting imaginative flood? Emily? Yeah, um, in this sense, true, I imagine, means something pretty literal. It runs evenly and true, it runs straight. It has an orderly, correct track. But if we're it supposed to think of true as... Runs well, which is not a kind of Dickinsonian positive, necessarily. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think the way that the poem swerves into something more interesting and more unpredictable is her way of letting us know or suggesting that truth is kind of arbitrary and essentially unimportant if it isn't even powerful enough to keep her on this smooth, true track. So the brain that's running evenly is a brain that's thinking conventionally. As in business school they say, um, that brain is thinking inside the box. What Emily is looking for is a brain that thinks outside the box. And interestingly, in that, and I'm really responding to Charles's question here, in that situation, true is something fine and good and conventional. So it's a very rare 19th century person who is speaking about true and putting it behind her as the brain does its crazy, unpredictable, imaginative thing. Wow. All right, well, we're going to go to the phone. Lily, who do we have there? Um, this is Amparo calling from Texas, and she wants to talk a little more about dwell and possibility. Okay, well, let's put her up. Okay, dwell and possibility. Let's see. I think we might... Oh, we uh, had another question about that on Twitter, so oh, good. I'm glad Why we're getting we to it. Oh, good. Why do we add the two together? So, um, Amparo, can, you want to put her on? Amparo, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear here in Texas. What part of Texas? I am in the South, Perland, very close to Houston. South Texas. Well, welcome. This is great. So, how is ModPo so far? Very good. And I want to say hello to everybody. You are so wonderful people that you triggered my uh, somewhat having cobwebs about this I dwell in possibility. I just want to know. Wait, I'm Carl. One second. You said hello to us. We're going to say. Hello to you. So, okay. Max, say hello to Amparo. Hello, Amparo. Hi hello, there. Good morning. I'm Maurice. Hello. Julia. Good morning. Jason. Good morning. Good morning. Anna, say hello to Amparo in South Texas. I <laughs> see you all. You're all looking Here's, so good. They do look good. Emily, <laughs> Emily, a couple of weeks in New, in, at Yale University, and you still look fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> Despite right. that, Molly, say hello to Amparo. Good morning. Erica. Good morning. Hi. Amparo, hello, you're part sir. of the family now. You're part of the community. <laughs> Don't ever leave us, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you wanted to talk so about I dwell in possibility? Yeah. I, I have gray hairs like you in the, was that Dave? And I'm triggered by Wait a minute. Message. Did you just say Dave has gray, gray hair? <laughs> Wait, there's, it's, it's there's a little gray up here. Close up. <laughs> oh, come on, close up. Oh, never mind. Uh, We're going to stipulate that there's gray somewhere in there. Go ahead, Amparo. You've really, you've really made a friend of Dave right away. Uh, I, everybody, and I appreciate your uh, enthusiasm to make us learn together with you. I like the way you handle the class in this website thing. Yes. And uh, I learn a lot. Thank you. I I will in recommend this to my other friends. Good. Bring like them all in. Maybe you can create a study group in that that spot south of Houston. Oh, that's a nice idea. I yeah. will try that. Yes. So did you have a question? I've sidetracked you because you were talking about Dave's gray hair. Um, <laughs> do you have a question about I dwell in possibility? Yes. I am triggered by the radicalism of Emily Dickinson, but they said it, she was a radical, but I don't understand that through the poem I dwell in possibility. I want to relate question. it to my job as a special education teacher, what's the main message of that? Yes. Oh, boy. I can't wait to respond to this. So the first part of the question is, yes, I get that I'm going to stipulate, I'm going to assume with all the Modpo people that Emily is a radical. 
But when I read I dwell in possibility, I don't see that. So I'd like for us to take a crack at this. Uh, this is a really important question. And not belabor it too much, but let's just go around on the table here and say a word or two about what, what's radical about that poem. And then we can answer the second part, which is Amparo's implicit desire to understand how her experience as a special ed teacher might want to connect with this poem. I have something to say about that. Max, quickly, uh, why is it radical? Uh, well, on one hand, it's, I mean, if you think of it contextually, historically, this is a poem by a woman in the mid-19th century, a poem about the space of the home, the domestic sphere, and she's really kind of exploding it and taking control of it in a way, which is, uh, I think, sociopolitically so radical. So the whole right? issue of exploding domesticity, <clears throat> yep. that's one thing, kind of me me messing up the house, good. Uh, and also designing her own house. Like designing her own house, Saying to yeah. the community of, let's say, particularly powerful and male designers of houses, construction people, builders, architects, I really would like to design my own, thank you very much, and it's impossible because I have a, uh, an infinite warranty on my roof since it's, since it's the air, the sky, the roof, the sky's the limit. Yeah, cool. Dave, radical? Yeah, and that's exactly what she's doing with the whole concept of judging poems by the way they fit in a traditional form, which is one way of, up, up to this point, of really evaluating poems, how well they fit in this form, and she's saying, no, this form doesn't work. Ba she's pushing out the ballad form. She's using it, but pushing it. Uh, Amaris, why is it radical? Um, also, perhaps because she is reversing the traditional hierarchy between poetry and prose and saying not only that poetry contains more possibility for her, but her brand of poetry, and there's been many discussions already on the forums in terms of her punctuation, although it's deceptively looks like four line stanzas in a sort of um, traditional form um, visually, which is also probably why editors um, did Malta. commit the injustice of yeah. right, um, changing her punctuation. Yeah. There's a lot at the level of the line that really opens up the meanings versus... Okay, so it's radical because it's open, not closed, Amparo, because it's open, not open, closed. Not closed. Julia? There's something conceptually radical about simply dwelling in possibility because when we think of possibility, we think of the unknown, we think of something unending, something uncertain and indeterminate, and that itself is a tremendously radical act. We also think of houses as being able to be closed off rather than open. Mm -hmm. To build a house that's open, even though there are some closed off aspects of the thing, uh, you have to be pretty courageous. Um, quickly to Dan on this question, then Lily quickly on this question, and then Erica Kaufman quickly on this question. What's radical about this poem? And Dan wanted to make sure to go at it from a different, well, I'll just read what he spelled. <clears throat> Excuse me. Teaching special ed is radical. Every time you don't <laughs> underestimate a student, you dwell in possibility together. Right. Already. Webcast number one, and uh, we are moved by this. Um, I'm going to go Lily and Erica quickly, and then back to me for another comment about special ed and what Amparo is doing as a teacher, I think, in relation to the Dickinsonian radicalism. Boy, did I load that up. Uh, are you expecting something? Uh-oh. But <laughs> Lily first. You. Just quickly, thinking about the end of the poem, what's radical, more on a sociopolitical bent, like what Max said is, um, like Victorian women are supposed to kind of make themselves disappear in a domestic sphere, and Emily is taking her narrow hands and making them even and making them bigger, so big that they're as big as paradise. Like she's yeah. really expanding her identity and stretching it out. Yes, as opposed to and that's narrowing very radical. Yeah. Erica Kaufman, you're a radical, so you have a s radical sympathy with Emily Dickinson. Speak from your radicalism. How about that for an introduction? Thank you. Um, I wonder if one can think about this idea of dwelling in possibility as a classroom setting. You know, for me at least as a teacher, I think about the best learning happens when you allow yourself to dwell in possibility. Yeah, that's really, really, really well put. And I'm so glad that you and Julia have created a space for teachers and I would encourage Amparo and lots of other teachers to go into that space in the site and, big, and, and, and watch some of the videos at least where we talk about how to teach these poems. So many of the poems are meta-pedagogical. I guess what I want to say following from Dan and what Erica just said is that Emily Dickinson speaks 
very directly to what might be today called neurodiversity. She is a she is a writer who thinks differently and she wants the writing to express that difference of thinking. So the the brain within its group is the mo is the classic example of neurodiversity. She's basically saying if we think a certain way, if we think a conventional, socially accepted way, if we conform our unusual way of thinking, we will miss out on the power that can derive from unusual thinking. And it's potentially a destructive power, and it potentially destroys the mill which a lot of conventional thinkers have set up in the 19th century by the river, because the river will always be the only source of power as the wheel gets turned by the river. But a brain can actually move the river so can a river move the river a flood, but a brain can move the river such that the mills, the business plan of the mill becomes moot. You can call that a kind of radical economic thinking, but you can also go to a higher level and think that here is Emily who's in her house, in her room thinking, I think differently, how shall my writing tell others in the future about the way I think differently? And truth starts to become I'm not going to say relative, but larger, but larger. Amparo, I hope yes. that you're going to see Dickinson as informing your teaching. This would be cool. Yeah, I, I really would like to think about that way. And uh, somehow, most of us, especially as teachers, have that radicalism. <laughs> I was wondering why I was put in that occupation there is a purpose of the higher above for that. And then when you uh, discuss this I dwell in possibility and the word occupation at the job, yes, I said... It's a job, it's a calling, it's a residing, and it is this, which happens to be what you and I and others are doing right now. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you, Amparo, for calling. So nice thank to you. make your acquaintance. And please stay with ModPo to the end and bring your friends. Yeah, I will. Thank, thank you so you. much. That God was, bless you all. God bless you. That was so great. Thank you. Julia, what do we got? Um, Boy, Amparo made my day. So Kirsten Clapp for just posted on the discussion forum. and I Houston? Kirsten. 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 Um, and this is a great comment. I can get on board with the idea that there is no one right interpretation um, but our, but we are, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. It does matter what the author's original intention was. Um, Gambrels is something specific. Emily Dickinson is distinguishing between other types of roofs in order to communicate some meaning, which means we do need to do research. So I feel like this comment is kind of in dialogue with what Jason said and with what I said. Mm -hmm. Jason told us about looking up Gambrels and how that led him to do more research, I mm -hmm. said um, somewhat blithely that you don't know, you hardly need to do any research at all. It's what you bring to the poem. So maybe we could think about, because there are a lot of questions on the discussion forums right now about interpretation and what we do when we read. Okay, so we're going to take a few minutes, Kirsten, to respond to this, but Kirsten, this is going to come back again and again and again. So let's make sure in the comments that we elicit now in the next couple minutes that someone speaks to the whole question of authorial intention. So we're going to go to Eric first and then Jason. Um, good morning, Eric. I don't think you've said hello yet directly on mic. Hello to Hi. everyone. Yes. Good so, morning. Um, authorial intention <coughs> can depend on the author, the poem, and when the author comes to the poem. Some poems are rev revised over and over again. Song of Myself is a poem that is revised for 41 years, um, and at different moments, different sorts of meanings can coalesce in a poem. For, so one thing that you're doing here is complicating the very idea of intention. Intention at what moment in time? Authors, poets' intentions are going to shift over time as they reread and revise and rethink. That complicates intention firstly. Go ahead. So yeah, and there's a critic called J. Hillis Miller who starts his career trying to understand authorial intention and the mind of the author. And at a certain point in his career, he realizes that this is like trying to chase the sun, because all or of lean us, against the sun. Absolutely, um, we are all evolving, and as poems and poets evolve, 
meanings can change. When you're reading a poem, bring your best creativity to it. It's not that we're saying don't go out and don't investigate. What we're saying is that part of what you're investigating is yourself, your own experience. Bring that to the poem. Bring patience to the poem. Bring the ability to do it more than once. Follow almost like jazz music each time you come. Bring the ability to change the riff. Very nicely put. Jason, you want to add to that? That was great. Thank you, Eric. Eric, by the way, is a community TA. Thank you for doing that. That's a volunteer thing, we realize. And to all the community TAs, shout out to all you guys, wherever the heck you are. T in the Philippines. Thank you, T. Let's see. It's probably just about bedtime for T. Jason, quickly yes. on this. Okay. Um, I think that... <clears throat> It's important to, we have Emily Dickinson, but we haven't talked about Walt Whitman yet. And what Al was just speaking to as to the ever-changing position of the author is useful to remember that Whitman rewrote and rewrote and rewrote Leaves of Grass. And so whichever um, iteration of it that we are reading, we are with one moment of Walt Whitman, and does that mean that his deathbed edition is the correct one, that he finally achieved the right one, or is his first draft interfered by readers, being Walt Whitman himself, um, interfering with the author's original intention? Right. So these are literary historical questions, philolo philological questions, lex lexicographical questions, and we're not saying, Kirsten, that those are not appropriate. They're great. They're great. But what we want to do is coalesce around all kinds of ways of understanding the choice of a word like gambrels. And, and there are many approaches to it. And in a course on modern and contemporary American poetry that introduces people to the work, we take advantage of the fact that there are tens of thousands of people who are working on the same word all at once. Mm -hmm. And if you use the forums to accumulate guesses at intention, evidence of intention, um, uh, readings that disregard 19th century vocabulary entirely, fully subjective and emotional responses, which are after all human responses and therefore have humanity in common with the author, all those responses are good. We are not so formalistic in Modpo. We're going to have to clarify this as we go. We're not so formalistic that we don't want biographical and historical information. But what we want to do when we begin is to slowly look at the words as they've been deployed and try to imagine that Emily is one of the many readers of her own poem. So when she wrote The Brain Within Its Groove, or when Walt Whitman talked about singing himself, he often had no idea where these words were going to go, and he had no better an idea at the beginning, and even at the end, than we do now. So we're all kind of happily at sea, I would say. I, I want to I move on, though. We have a, a phone call. Lily, what do we have? Um, well, first, quickly, I want to say that Moshe from Israel, we accidentally got disconnected, and I apologize. Um, Hello, him, Moshe. But I hope he calls back. Um, he will, no but doubt. this is Juan calling from Barcelona, and he has a question about tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Hey, bring him up. Good morning, Juan, or good afternoon. Uh, yeah, good afternoon here. <laughs> How are you? I'm really good. How are you? What's your experience in Modpo so far? What's going on? Uh, well, uh, basically, I tried it uh, last year, but I couldn't finish it uh, because, well, some things came up. Um, I'm origi originally from Venezuela, so I was over there. I was working, and I couldn't do it through the whole way. But uh, this is so. This is the second time I'm trying, and I'm really having fun, fun with it. I hope you'll stay with us all ten weeks. It'll be fun. Do you Hopefully. have Do you have a question for the gang here? Yeah. Uh, well, I wanted to talk about Emilia Dickinson's concept of truth. Uh, I mainly do uh, philosophy. I'm, I'm doing an MA in philosophy. So um, I wanted to go uh, to, I don't know, I think you guys in, in, the, in the discussions, I think um, there's a particular line that I liked about this poem. Uh, the, the, the one I'm talking about is uh, success and search with lies. 
And well, I, I, I knew you guys. Uh, I heard you guys in the in the live webcast talking about truth. And I just wanted to go um, on to discuss maybe the concept of truth, uh, not as, uh, as as an as an end, but as a going process, which is I think what this line is talking about. Uh, truth, uh, you know, when I hear circuit, I think of connections and process instead of uh, just an end. Yes. And I, I wanted to see if you guys could abound on that, maybe talk about it a little bit. Wonderful. Thank you, Juan. Success in process lies. Right, success in connection lies. That's great. And of course, you're singing the singing with the Modpo Choir here by talking about the importance of process over ends. So I'll invite um, anybody here, and I want to um, say hello, and also invite um, Linda, who's here. This is Linda. Uh, Zach, can you uh, do your camera magic here? So Linda, good morning. Uh, you don't have a mic, so you don't have to answer. Uh, Linda's here. Tim is in the back there. Good morning, Tim. Uh, Jen is here, who's crossed the river from Collingswood. Is that right? Nearby, wonderful town. Um, Eric, you've already met. Dan, you've heard from already. And Maria, who's joining us in the back there. So I think I want to put Max on the spot, who's, who got a big smile on his face when Juan started talking about his interest in philosophy. And then I want to uh, then I want to see maybe what um, what Linda has to say about truth. Do you have the poem in front of you? You do. Okay, tell all the truth, but tell it slant success and circuit lies. So let's go to Max first. I think Juan uh, hit it on the head. It's a it's a sort of processual uh, or bottom up almost idea of truth. I want to say existentialist, but maybe Juan can correct me on this since he's the one getting the MA in philosophy. Um, <laughs> That you mean your PhD in uh, English is not covering philosophy? We don't talk University about Chicago. truth. No. <laughs> we don't talk about <laughs> yeah, at the University of Chicago. Let it be known at the University of Chicago, we don't talk much about the truth. No, we sure don't. I, I'm feeling I'm feeling really good about higher education. No, I'm being funny. Go I ahead. You're being funny. Um, yeah, it's it's almost a kind of I I don't want to say it's relativist uh, at all, but it's it's definitely a, a way of thinking about truth that's um, that's yeah. It's about process. It's about uh, it's about existence. It's about doing. It's about uh, things in the moment. So you're affirming what Juan says. I'm affirming that's what good. Juan says. Thank you, um, Linda. What do you have to say about this? You're on the spot, and I'm sorry for that. That's okay. Um, so, you know, I'm glad that Juan proposed this question because success in circuit lies is sort of the line in this poem that I have the most trouble with. Um, but thinking about it as in terms of that connection and process um, and sort of springboarding off what other people are saying. Um, when you get to the end of the poem, it says, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Um, it sort of speaks to, to me um, that truth is somewhat subjective and that you get an absolute truth by piecing together um, each individual truth. Wow! Almost a cubistic idea of the truth. If you get, if you go around the world, it's almost Whitmanian. If you go around the world and you gather all subjective angles at the truth, you will eventually get to the truth because it's the collectivity of truths. Um, and then that. Are you is studying philosophy in the Franklin Building at the <laughs> University of Pennsylvania? <laughs> Everybody is a, Everybody a study in of the philosophy, right? <laughs> um, no, and then when you get to that absolute, you know, you have to look at it through your own subjectivity, or else you'll be blinded by. Wow. The All right. Well, um, I'm going to turn to Anna in Boston, but meantime, I want to go back to Juan. Juan, what do you hear yeah. so far? Everybody seems to be agreeing with you. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, that makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but, um, but, but I also wanted to maybe uh, complicate it just a little bit. I knew um, you would do because, that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a philosopher. Sorry for that. <laughs> but, um, well, um, what I wanted to um, also talk about is maybe truth, not as in a, subje in a, is a subjective way, but just truth as uh, the process itself, uh, because I, I think there is a little bit of a difference over there. And um, I, I wouldn't relate it uh, necessarily to existentialism, but uh, definitely existentialism uh, picks up on Nietzsche in this way, in, in eternal return, and, um, and just truth as a constant going back to the same thing. 
And I relate that to dueling and possibility and just coming back uh, to, to one same thing over and over again, maybe rethinking and just uh, you were talking also about out of the box thinking. Uh, I think we can we can talk about truth in that way. Truth that's in the process mainly, and uh, maybe not subjective, but just objective in the ter in terms of the process itself. That's so well put. And as Matpo goes on, we're going to closely examine the way we use the word subjectivity and objectivity, starting with um, chapter two, which is the rise of imagism, and then we get to Gertrude Stein. And by the way, Juan, I'm going to ask you to, not yet, but I'm going to ask you to hang up so the next caller can call and listen to Anna's response. Um, through your computer, but um, I would like to urge you to stay, you know, all the way through the course, but particularly to call back when we talk about Gertrude Stein, because we're going to need you. Oh, great, perfect. Uh, that'll be good. <laughs> that'll thank, be, thank you be... so much. Okay, so you hang up and okay, listen to Anna's response. That will free up the phone. Hello, Anna. Are you ready for this? Maybe. Okay, say, <laughs> say what you'd like to say. Brain, uh, the tell all the truth, but tell it slant success and circuit lies. There's been a lot of discussion forum conversation about this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough poem, no question, because I think it does. It it is a, such a short, concise poem that tackles such a huge question. Um, and I think it is. I think it's fair to ask questions of truth. And I think it's amazing that this poem by saying something kind of ultimately radical about our relationship to truth um, makes us question kind of how we, how we feel about this question. I think it's amazing that the poem can do that, but I guess I kind of always just look back to the poem and, and keep my thoughts about truth there um, and maybe just just listen to the words of the poem in the form of the poem to to think about this question of truth. I want to thank you, Anna. I want to take a poll. I've never done this in a webcast. I'm actually going to ask for a show of hands, okay? And see if I can formulate this question. So Emily Dickinson talks about the surprise, the superb surprise, and she talks about kind explanations, um, which give the truth gradually, right? And she talks about the consequences of not doing that, which would be that everybody would be blind, blinded by the truth if we didn't tell it slant. So my question is simplistic, binaristic question, but I just want to get a poll to see where we are. And I invite everybody in the forums to do the same thing. So do you think that Emily Dickinson is ultimately contending that these kind explanations are better than the dazzling truth. This is Emily whom we've seen dazzle us herself, such as in the brain within its groove. So the question is, raise your hand in a minute if you think that Emily really is valorizing, affirming, and supporting the kind explanation that might, not, might diminish the surprise that could blind us. And I've put it in a way to see if I can elicit some votes. How many of you would raise your hand for that? Oh my goodness. So most of you think that Emily is not so sure that she likes the idea of the kind explanation. Uh-oh. Opposite. So I asked the question badly. All right, good. Who wants to, who wants to speak to this question that I've asked badly? Lily, this is a great teaching tool, Erica, by the way. Pose a question, binarist a question badly, have people re have people revolt against the question, and then you get a really excited, <laughs> and the truth will dazzle gradually as a result. It's metapedagogy. Go ahead, Lily. Okay. Well, I'm not 100 percent sure on my answer here, but I think you are. She's more talking about a mode of almost maybe even a mode of teaching. Like she doesn't want it is teaching. the um, like. Children. Truth. She doesn't want like a truth bomb to drop on someone and be like a truth uh, bomb. Yes. Use of use of direct telling of truth to sort of control or have power over people. She right. wants a more uh, a kind explanation or a circuitous explanation so that whoever is receiving the truth can participate a wow. little bit more. So we found Emily Dickinson in a Whitmanian social pedagogical moment where she wants the recipients of her meaning to form a congregation, I mean in the etymological sense, the, a communion or a circuit, 
a circuit of meaning received. Wow. I actually never thought about the poem that way. Um, we have someone on the phone, but I'd like to ask Julia if we have something in the um, discussion forums or Twitter feed that would be relevant to bring up at this moment. We have a question about, about leaves of grass, so can we okay. talk a little bit about yeah. Whitman? Yeah, who's, who's uh, asking so the question? So I, I, don't, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, but I want to say it's Yariv Piron. Yeah, it's probably Yariv. Yariv. We've seen Yariv in the discussion forums a lot. He's terrific. Who, Hello, Yariv, if you're watching. Who writes, the word democracy appears repeatedly in Leaves of Grass, and Whitman's individualism can be identified with the American spirit. Is this a political poem? And there's a follow-up comment from Nathan Walker um, who says, actually, this poem ex envelops and extends beyond politics. So I thought we could talk for a second about what's the political politics about. Politics of Whitman. Politics okay, of cool. Whitman. All right, I'm going to put Jen on the spot. Sorry, Jen. Jason, can you bring the mic to Jen? So, Jen, just you, you have read the Whitman. I started the course yesterday, so I'm about halfway through. So okay, well, that, you're halfway through. Right the, you've read a little of the Whitman? I'm halfway through the week. Okay, so. good. So we're gonna, you're, you're off the hook then. <laughs> Maria, can I put you on the spot? Uh-oh, Maria's not happy about this. Actually, I haven't, I haven't read, uh, read, um, read Whitman, yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. So let's go over to, um, uh, let's go to Eric, who has an idea. Politics of Whitman. Yeah, and Eric and I were actually in a thread together about this very topic. You were in a thread together. I mean, this is... This is virtual stuff. And Julia, I'm always very happy to thread with you. <laughs> um, so I want to talk for a second about the birth of this poem as a poem. But it's got to be quick. OK. Whitman's on a bus. And he's, he's on an omnibus. We can see it in the shakes of his, hand, of his handwriting and from other notes we have. He writes down, I am the poet of the body. And I am the poet, and something like, I'm the poet of slaves and of the masters of slaves. And we begin to hear for the very first time the rhythm and cadence that will become Song of Myself. He rewrites this in such a way that he makes it clear he puts himself physically between the slave and the master of slaves. And Whitman, at this moment of crisis, at the moment of the center of the political crisis of America, becomes the poet of America. Now, yes, this poem does a lot more than talk about politics. But it's born at a moment of political crisis, and it is that crisis which brings his prose notes into poetry. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. That leads us to my posing the following question, which I'm going to ask around the table and elsewhere. Okay, so the question Yariv and Nathan asks is about the politics and the democratic impulse of this writing and the question I have for you a little more narrowly is, what is it about the style of catalog and lists and unsubordinated lists and parataxis, to use that word, that is democratic? Is there a politics to style? Is there a politics to form? Modpost says, yes. Can you elaborate, starting with Max, then Amaris? Yeah, sure. I mean, as you said, it uh, already unsubordinated list, right? So there's no subordination. That's that's a pretty democratic. And given ideal. what Eric just said about the origin of the poem, if there's no subordination, if you're an anti-slavery but you're not writing directly about slavery in a political kind of writer's sort of way, but you are writing, right, Eric, in a form that is defying subordination, you are anti-slavery, you are abolitionist, and you are standing on what most of us, all of us, would deem the right side of history in that people in the United States, because we said so in our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence, need to be treated equally, and they need to be treated equally in the poem. Sorry, I riffed a little. You got it. Lists are, yeah, <laughs> I got it. Lists are democratic. Dave, can you, uh, Amaris, can you first add anything about why lists, a kind of writing, could be democratic? Um, I think we see here just such an effusive abundance of items and um, that sort of speaks to an all-inclusiveness, both of the low and the high that he includes here. There's a lot of organic language in it and also speaks to the discussion we were having previously about truth being from multiple perspectives and kind of this idea there, there is a line about explanation in Leaves of Grass and the explanation he finds, I think, is a blade of grass or something very simple. And so in that sense, it's sort of that feeling of connection 
that Walt Whitman has to his environment and to external things and this ability to look around that sort of negates the possibility of a direct truth or absolute truth. Exactly. So the aesthetic is he wants everybody and everything in the poem, and that's implicitly democratic, and the style bears that out. Emily Harnett, I'm surprising you by asking, but can you say one more thing about the politics of Whitman's style? Um, I think you guys covered it fairly well. But yeah, that all that all-inclusive style is ultimately just a, a democratic gesture. Um, and you can map his stylistic choices almost directly onto a politics of yeah, an egalitarian democratic politics. And it, we're going to turn to Lily for one more phone call, but um, the question that was arising earlier and in the forums about Dickinson's different approach it doesn't make her anti-democratic, and it doesn't make her necessarily elitist. What it means is that Dickinson does not feel that her approach to aesthetics and life requires everyone crawling into the poem with her. So she is going to be exclusive in the most neutral sense of that term. That doesn't make her less democratic. It makes her style less uh, about the communion of opposites as an inclusion in the poem. So elitist is not quite the word we mean, but in the dwell in possibility, she's saying a visitor is the fairest. Basically saying that Whitman and the Whitmanian tradition is indiscriminate. Emily Dickinson is saying, I am discriminate. That doesn't mean that she's discriminatory. It means she is discriminate. If you get, if you want to do the work of understanding her poem, you get to come into the poem. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because once you're there and you do understand it, you're in. So I think that's a politics. And that is a politics. And we've talked about Emily Dickinson as a radical, so there's no worry in this room, in this hour, that we've left her out from politics. Not at all. So we're going to take one more phone call, and then we're going to do some shout-outs, and we're going to wrap up. Don't know how that happens, but we're going to do it. Lily? Uh, Moshe from Israel called back, and we have him through this time. <laughs> okay, Moshe from Israel. Moshe, my friend. Hi. How are you doing? How are you? It's great to hear your voice. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here again. A year later, I went through a significant metamorphosis uh, with this course and other courses on uh, American poetry. Uh, my question, I have to... Wait, question. wait. You can't just dangle that out there and, uh, not, and go right to your question. You said you've experienced a change in metamorphosis as you go with Modpo. Do you want to say a little yes. bit about what that is? Well, I had a library full of uh, American poets, including two seniors, and uh, two books that you have sent me, Ron Cinnamon, uh, The Alphabet, John Don, and you name it. And a few others, studying them by myself, taking some other courses through the Internet, mostly studying it by myself, doing analysis by myself, and things like that. Yes, and so, um, and what's changed? It, I'm sorry? And what has changed? Uh, what has changed? Yes, you said uh, you've I became experienced... Addicted. I became addicted. Addicted? To this, to this uh, study. I spend uh, a lot of my free time uh, in uh, poetry, English poetry. I wrote myself a little bit. Uh, I wrote some poems myself. And, and what do your children and grandchildren say about dad and grandpa who's obsessed with American poetry? Um, crazy. <laughs> Just, uh, Good crazy, crazy it's though. Not that. Let, let me put it this way, and seriously, even people at work are jealous of me. Jealous that I'm not doing only work, which is mathematics, computers, economics, investments in the world. Also doing something for the spirit, and people are really jealous of me. Yes, great. That, seriously. We are glad you're with us. I'm sorry I delayed the asking of your question, but please, let's, let's hear your question, then we'll get some brief well, responses. Uh, 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 it's obsolete already, but I wanted to say about the word truth that I think uh, Michel Foucault has an article which relates Parentia to a truth, which... It talks about the different versions of uh, the word truth or the fact whether you say, what is the meaning of saying the truth? That's one thing, it's, uh, and, and that's what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to raise any discussion at the end of the, the webcast now, 
But I had another question, uh, which hopefully I'll get sometimes a future as uh, uh, an answer in the future. I was wondering uh, on the statistics or the distribution of students, the country distribution of students in this class, because there's a lot of. Uh, there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, there, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, postmodern and experimental poetry, which may be uh, sometimes some very odd to to many uh, people. So just to see uh, uh, the reaction yes. of people on that. Well, it's a very good question. Um, last year we haven't done a poll this year, but last year we we had 179 nations represented in Modpo. Just uh, I think 49% only, 49% were North Americans. That left 51% from everywhere else. So surprisingly, because we're dealing with an English in these poems, these experimental poems, that's uh, a little difficult, we have lots and lots of people from all over. And I think everybody would agree that the students who's, who are international, that is to say not from this, not from the United States, um, have accepted and been interested in the experimental poems of the contemporary period just as much as everybody else. So it's it's yeah. very gratifying in itself. Uh, and uh, yeah, amazing. And uh, Moshe mentioned Michel Foucault, and it may not have been clear that he referred to Foucault, and it's F O U C A U L T. And please don't try to read Foucault while you're doing Modpo because it will blow your mind and also it's like another course. But, <laughs> but thank you for thank you for that. And Moshe, thank you very much for being part of the Modpo family. Thanks for calling. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes by thanking people, but first I want to go around and get uh, quick final words about Emily Dickinson or Walt Whitman or the first week of Modpo. I want everybody who's on here, TAs, to give out a piece of advice about how to deal with Modpo, one little thing, because we haven't talked about how to manage the discussion forums, we haven't talked about all the other ancillary things that are going on, so this is a good opportunity for us to sort of uh, cheerlead people, encourage them to stay with us. Uh, so I'm going to start with Molly. Molly, just one thing, some final word of encouragement to Modpo people who are listening. Just enjoy it. Don't worry too much about having the, the right answer or the solution to the poems because <laughs> you'll be chasing the sun. Yeah, and leaning on it. And, you know, when, and one of the great things about starting with Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman, and particularly Dickinson, is, you know, the right answer, that's a very dubious proposition, right? So this is the week when Julia and I take the most shit about the quizzes, right? Because... <laughs> So, but that's, this is, we like that. And then we get over that. Don't worry about the quizzes. We think they're rather silly, but we do them, and they're meant to uh, basically allow you to affirm or reinforce concepts that you've seen in the video discussions, period. Exactly. Full stop, dash. But, <laughs> but we understand we can make them better. I mean, they're quizzes, and quizzes are not appropriate to a course this far outside of the STEM disciplines. So, but thank you for bearing with us, right, on the quizzes. Um, Erica Kaufman, a word of wisdom, advice, uh, anything to add? Um, I've been thinking about two quotes during this webcast that maybe are helpful. One, I can't fully remember who, who it is, but the idea that a poem should not mean but be. Archibald McLeish. Um, and then the other quote is Williams, a poem is a small or large machine made of words. Yeah. And that's... And both, both, you know, kind of make me think about just the idea of, like, living with poetry and not worrying so much about right and wrong, but just living with the language. Yeah. Wonderful. Good. Thank you so much, and thanks for joining us this morning. So, Emily Harnett in New Haven, what's up? Nothing much, Al. Thank you. You're looking at what's up. <laughs> <laughs> but do you want to say one thing for the Modpo people? Certainly. Um, my Emily fans out there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, as I look at all these poems, I realize, you know, and for me, it's I guess it's the third time studying them in this concentrated way. And you could still spend an infinite amount of time on each poem. And there's a real temptation to do that. So my suggestion to all of you would be to not feel overwhelmed by the wealth of material that we're engaging with each week. 
and to find the poem that you feel the most of a relationship with, that you're most interested in. And don't worry about letting yourself focus and really engage with that one specifically. Great. Good recommendation. Thank you, Emily. Anna, Anna Strong. Um, I just took a second to answer one really great question um, in the forums from Cindy, um, who asked, you know, how do I read Whitman when I've just been reading Dickinson? You know, how do I tackle reading these two very different poets? Can we use the same reading techniques for Dickinson as we do for Whitman? Um, and I and I wrote back to her, but I just wanted to share um, the advice that I gave, which I actually kind of pirated from Ron Silliman, who we'll meet in Chapter 9. But he once said that every poem carries with it its own instructions for reading. And I just, ever since he said that, I've always tried to think of it when I read um, these difficult poems, because you should you should really allow the form of the poem to tell you how to read it. And I think that's a great way to think about Dickinson and Whitman, because yep. Emily is so concentrated and Whitman is so expansive that when you read them, um, that is going to tell you how to, how to read them differently. Wonderful response to the question that Kirsten and others have raised, which is how much external referentiality do we need in order to get a handle on this? And at least for starters, what Ron is saying is absolutely true. If you read the poem carefully, it will teach you how to teach it. It will teach you how to teach yourself. Thank you, all of those of you in the Google Hangouts. Now let's go to Max. Final thought, final word, advice? Sure, to piggyback off of uh, what Anna just said, um, I think keeping your Whitmanian lenses and your Dickinsonian lenses handy throughout the course um, will be really useful when it comes to approaching more difficult poems. And you should, while I agree, yeah, the, the poem teaches you how to read it, it's also fun to kind of apply a Whitmanian lens to a Dickinsonian poem and kind of let your, your, your reading wander and let your, your approaches mingle. Fantastic. Thank you, Max, and thanks for joining us here it is in Philadelphia. My pleasure. I think most of the time we're going to see you in the little most box. Most of the time you'll see me in a little box. Okay, um, cool. It's where I like apartment. you, uh, Max. <laughs> it's always best to have Max in a little box somewhere. I, I love my little boxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Dave Poplar, a word of wisdom. This is a wise man. <laughs> it's funny because I just wanted to comment about the concept of truth that everybody was talking about really quickly because it is an interesting discussion whether we're talking about truth as an actual thing or whether it's aspirational or whether it's just a process. Uh, it's something to keep in mind because throughout Modpo we'll see how the poems uh, evolve in the way that they approach this concept or these constellation of concepts. Cool. Thank you, Dave. Amaris. Um, and to go quickly back to authorial intent, um, of course, your speculations should have some anchoring in the historical um, context or even the context of the form of the poem, but don't let your ideas about the intention of the author limit the possibilities of your readings. I think if you just do that, you'll be fine, because Emily's version of truth is possibility, so if you want to stay true to her philosophy, you'll keep yourself open. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Amaris. You're rather Dickinsonian today. <laughs> Julia Block. I want to say two things. Uh, number one, please use your office hours. We are all keeping office hours throughout the course. If you're feeling totally overwhelmed by the discussion forums, we don't blame you. A really good way to get in touch with us quickly is to go to the office hours link on the left-hand side of the course. And we have office hours every single day. One of us does. Lily has office hours today. Jason does. I think somebody else does today. They're all Philadelphia time, so you might need to do some math to figure out when we're actually there. Um, and we actually, we also like break into each other's office hours. Like I broke into Jason's office hours yesterday. I mean, Dave Poplar's office hour was like a love fest of <laughs> his friends. It's really a lounge. More it's than a office. lounge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this is really important. Um, so our goal in Modpo is to is to have the poems openness speak to us. The poems that deserve to be interpreted by lots of people speak to us. It speaks to the way Modpo as a massive open online course has been created. And it requires us to be open. And the only way to be open is to get everybody, to enable everybody in the course to feel that this is a not impersonal experience. And if you go into an office, I mean, how many of you can say that in a massive open online course, you went into a forum and got essentially a synchronous response, that you felt you were in Dave Poplar's office with him? Lounge. Lounge. <laughs> That's 
what our goal is. That is what our goal is. It is a crazy, radical goal that is absolutely no more radical than Emily Dickinson. It's actually an outdated goal at the live university. You know, people rarely make it into office hours when they need to. So exactly. we're doing it's like it here. Exactly, return to tradition, the office hour. <laughs> it's sort of like, next thing you know, doctors associated with ModPo are going to be making house calls. All right, I want to go to Jason for a final word, then Lily. Jason, quickly final word, I piece have, of advice. I have office hours later today, and I look forward to hearing from everybody who's listening. And um, don't get tangled up in the fact that that we're reading language in as poems. If if the poets wanted to write prose and to give you a direct message, they would have written prose. So think of a poem. If if you want to think of the truth of a poem, you could think of the truth of a painting or the truth of a of Central Park or of I mean if we think of or the truth of a, a piece of architecture. The truth of those things only comes through use and participation, which is something that renders poetry, in my opinion, as one way that it is different from prose. Yeah, really cool. Thank you. Um, I want to get a final word from Lily, and then among our audience, I want to ask Dan if he has a final word for us. And then I am going to wrap up with some shout outs. Lily. I've been hearing and seeing a lot on the forum of people feeling uncertain or nervous. Maybe it's their first time studying poetry or they feel like, um, you know, what could they possibly bring to the table or whatever. But I kind of want to emphasize that um, rather than thinking of, um, you know, we had a caller earlier today say she wasn't sure she was getting all the references. Like, rather than worry about what you're not getting, think to yourself what it is that you bring to the poem. So you are a person with a specific background. <laughs> age, um, you know, you bring something to the poem and you meet it there as you're reading it on the screen or the page. So rather than focus on y what your experience isn't, think about what your experience has been. And then especially if you bring that into the forums, there's no way you're going to miss something in the poem. Very well put. Um, Dan, a, a final word from Dan before I do wrap-ups? Sorry, we need a mic. Dan says, speaking of Whitman and democracy, keep in mind that a number of the poets seem to believe that every thought or overheard line is entitled to one vote. Nice. Wow. One poet, one vote. I love that. One thought, one vote. Um, some shout outs. First of all, to Laura Cushing, our beloved community TA, who for the first time, yeah, there's some applause for Laura and some snaps. For the first time in the history of ModPo, uh, the long history of ModPo, Laura has assembled in the study groups forum a master list of all of the study groups. ModPo works really well if you join a study group. It can be a virtual group or it can be a meetup, right? So uh, she sets it up so that the first category is areas of interest. We have 50 plusers. We have people who are hopelessly lost. Um, which is a big group. We have uh, uh, overreaders, anonymous people who overread things. Uh, librarians and archivists, which is being re led by Ray Maxwell, uh, etc. There's a Dodge Poetry Festival meetup. But Treva Stos, who's I think overseas, or maybe she's back in Washington, think she's overseas. She reminded me this morning that we also ought to ballyhoo the international meetups. There's a lot of international groups being formed, study groups. The people in Italy are trying to figure out where they're going to meet. I'm going to be going to Prague in October and meeting a group that's, I hope, going to be meeting weekly by then. Uh, there are people in Manila, people in Athens, people in Glasgow, Los Angeles, etc. Of course, Washington, D.C. We urge you, we urge you to form study groups, either virtually in the discussion forums or live. A shout out to Steve Klein, who's a new ModPo guy. He's just adorable. I love Steve already. I don't even know him. Steve Klein. Uh, he says, close reading is like sitting down and talking with you, getting to know you. As a po Close reading, not just watching the videos, but then doing the close reading. I really like that part. As opposed to saying, hi, how you doing? And then moving on. What Steve is saying is like, the, the, the interaction he's getting in this course is, the, is akin to not just seeing someone and saying, how you doing, but actually getting to know someone. 
Uh, Alan Keaton wrote back saying, right on, Steve, etc. I wrote, yes, yes, Steve, it's a social act. Close reading is a social act when it's done in a massive open online course because hundreds and thousands of people are going to join you in the act of interpretation. No longer is it the realm of isolation. Steve then wrote, I love sitting in on your conversations, Al. So that's why I love Steve. I don't even know him. Cool. Uh, a shout out to Jappy, Jackie Lubeck who has been in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, for apparently 40 years. And for the last 20 has been running a Theater Day Productions, which is uh, with her partner, Jan. And uh, I've Googled Theater Day Productions. I put the link out. It's very interesting. And um, that group has been working with uh, young people in Gaza to, do, to produce youth theater, which is something that, let's hope, makes things a tiny bit easier. Uh, for them, and maybe not, but it's a good it's a good project. And then uh, she uh, just describes her experience uh, uh, about the poems and about Modpo. Uh, now she says, Jackie Lubeck from Gaza. Now I read the thing and I say, WTF? That's what the fuck. And then Al and crew explain it to me. And sometimes I say, right. And sometimes I say, oh come on. Hey, you're sitting at a window writing or thinking or looking or not. The world is right. And then a train crashes. So they have to pave paradise to put up a parking lot. As a playwright, I don't much care for the correct. As me, I don't have much care for the correct either, but everyone complains. And I guess I want to say to Jackie, welcome to Modpo, where we don't really care that much for the correct, but rather for the engaged and the beautiful, the way rather than the destination. So welcome, Jackie, and keep up the good work. Um, there was a wonderful article in Al Jazeera America about Modpo. I put the link up pretty widely, and I just wanted to shout out to, to a Modpoer who was mentioned in the article, and here's that little passage. The reach of the Modpo community has extended beyond the collective reading of poetry. Jamie Givens, 52, a massage therapist from Nashville, who's in her third year of Modpo now, said that when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, fellow Modpo participants rallied around her, offering emotional and financial support. Emotional and financial support. These are Modpo MOOC participants. Don't let anybody ever tell you that MOOCs are inherently impersonal. As, uh, as emotional and financial support as Jamie went through the treatment. She says, it's been rather stunning to me that people from all over the globe would be interested in my journey and humbling too, said Gibbons, who is now cancer free. To me, Mod Po is about the poetry, but it's also about how the poetry turns to us and says, can you be human? Can you be social? Can you work this out together? That's why we want puzzles, whoever it is that asked about puzzles. Maybe it was Harley and Charles. That's why we want puzzles. We want the stuff to be hard. As John Ashbery said about Gertrude Stein, I'd much rather less read the kind of writing that can be written. The kind of writing, kind of writing that can be written can be written. I'd rather read writing that can't be written. I'd rather read writing that's impossible. And as Dan has reminded us first in 2012 and repeatedly, nothing is impossible, not impossible. And I think Jamie is realizing that from another point of view, that this world is full of people who will support each other. And we're convening over poetry, but we're actually creating a community of interpreters, and that's the goal here. All right, finally, I just want to uh, say something about, uh, about uh, the brain, the brain within its groove. Uh, here's something that I wrote at the end of a long conversation about the brain within its groove and out-of-the-box thinking. And I want to conclude with this. I wrote, I have been reading this thread all along, folks. I hadn't contributed to it, but I had I'd been reading it. And I am here now just to say that I think it's apt and commensurate and fabulous that a discussion by dozens and dozens of people from all around the world about a brain exploding is itself so explosive. Like the poem and like the figure of the flood, and like the brain of the poet who believes in the power of the imagination, this thread rolls and goes its own way and cannot be controlled. It cannot be stopped. That thread, like all the others, can, is like the flood that will trodden out the mills. I don't know what the mills are. They could be traditional universities. They could be lecturers. 
They could be people who think they know the truth and have you come and pay a lot of money to receive it. They could be any kind of institutional structure that tells you that you are to receive, that you are an object of subjectivity. I'm not sure, but I know one thing, that when Mod Po people get on a roll, that they cannot be stopped, and that Dickinson is writing about that. This is the power of the imagination, I wrote, enacted in a discussion of a wild poem about the power of the imagination. Self-referentiality, I wrote, in learning lives. Erica, you can quote me on that. Self-referentiality in learning lives. Long live self-referentiality. Long live up with metapedagogy. So, in this flood of an educational mode, a new one, it's only a few years old, right? In this mode, we are reaching to, to Moshe in Israel and to Jackie in Gaza and to T in Manila and to Mod Poers in China and Kazakhstan and in South Africa, and we are together in this new educational mode enacting an out-of-the-box way of thinking that Dickinson wrote, had written about in the 1850s or 1860s. And thus we put ourselves in a position of understanding Emily Dickinson well. Certainly better in this commensurate, wild, out-of-control way, more commensurate than in the traditional way of sitting in rows and learning how wild the imagination can be certainly than writing in the box and being told that Emily Dickinson is writing about the wildness of the imagination. This crazy experiment that we're engaged in is enacting. This is why we mean that Mod Poe is formal. It is the form of what Dickinson is doing that is teaching us how to think about Dickinson and it is the form of what Dickinson is doing and the form of what we are doing in engaging with Dickinson that informs the way we are communing with Jamie and Jackie and Moshe. It is that for, and the special ed teacher, uh, Ampero, and all the special ed students who represent neurodiversity, which is, I almost want to say, an underclass in, 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 in the United States and elsewhere of people who have an amazing things to say, but do not have, are stuck in a groove and aren't being encouraged to break out of that groove and actually tell us the way they think, not what they think, but the way they think. So thank you to Maria for coming and catch up with Whitman <laughs> and Jen, catch up with Whitman and I'm sorry, Linda, Jen is back there and Linda and Tim, thanks for coming and Eric, as always, thank you, you're terrific. Thank you for your work and Dan, as ever, I want to say Dan is a community TA. We appreciate the work that you do. It's hard work. I saw Dan yesterday writing out responses to the discussion forums. Zach Cardiner, you're amazing. He's going to wave. There's a, <laughs> you're amazing. Thank you for everything that you do. Uh, Chris Martin, thank you so much for making the webcast and a lot of other stuff possible. Uh, Anna, love you. She's just waving at me. Emily, you too, and good luck at Yale. Don't, get, don't let the bozos get you down. <laughs> Sorry, I have a Yale thing. Erica Kaufman. We admire and respect what you do for teachers in your, at your program, which we'll tell people more about. We encourage everybody to click on four teachers. Four teachers. And guess what? It's so simple. I wanted it to be like Teach Po. And Erica and Julia are rolling their eyes. And it turns out to be four teachers, because what could be more appropriate than that phrase? It's four teachers and learners everywhere. Erica, thank you. Molly, I hope the Sunshine State is OK. We see pictures of Molly doing her amazing yoga stuff in the sunshine as opposed to in the snow. Max McKenna, you're the best. Thank you so much. I think so. Thanks. Dave Poplar, uh, you can take that gray out. Are there some products? Sorry, I'm kidding. We, we do this, don't we? Back at you, Al. That's what you're supposed to say. Amaris Kachansky, you're going to go back to Boston and maybe we'll see you at some point yeah, again. Yep. Julia Block, co teacher co-conspirator, thank you so much for everything. Good to be back at the table. Do you have a final, final word? Uh, other than come to our office hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, but keep, stay with keep us. going. Unsubscribe if you need to, but keep going. Stacy, Joanne in Atlanta, Harley, Charles, and Perro in, in South Texas, Kirsten, Juan in Barcelona, Yariv, who asked about democracy. Democracy lives, Yariv. 
Uh, Nathan and Moshe, thank you, and have a wonderful day, and we'll see you in the forums, and we'll see you in the office hours, and we'll see you at the next webcast, which will be next week. Bye-bye. And there is applause from one person. <laughs>